Right, well, very good morning, everyone at the Christchurch Tigerberg family and others who are joining us for this Sunday service on YouTube. And my name is Chris, and I'm a guest preacher this week for Christchurch Tigerberg, and it's a great privilege to be able to share God's Word with you. And before we do that, I want to ask you if you would join me as we just pray for this morning and for our country at this time. Let's pray. O sovereign God, we know that you are in control of all things. And we thank you that we can call you our Father because of Christ and because of his death for us on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. And we pray this morning that as we gather as the church throughout the world, as many people gather in person in the world and in our country, we gather in our homes at this time being restricted. We just pray that as your word is opened in the scriptures and your word is heard, that you would grow us and you would root us in Christ. And we pray this morning that wherever your word goes out faithfully, that it would achieve the very purpose for which you send it and that your Holy Spirit would accompany your word to achieve that work. We also bring before you at this time our country and especially our government as they deal with all sorts of challenges and especially this pandemic of COVID-19. And we pray, Father, for all city and provincial and governmental leaders that they would administer justly and fairly and with integrity. And we pray also, Father, for all of our medical workers and uh, doctors and nurses who are working hard in hospitals at this stage. We pray that you would strengthen them and that they would know your presence and your peace. And we lastly commit to you all those, Lord, in our churches who are suffering or battling physically or emotionally or financially at this time. And we pray that they would know your comfort and your presence and that they would keep looking to you, Christ. For your sake we pray. Amen. But for the reading this morning is taken from Colossians chapter 1 verse 28 to chapter 2 verse 10. Paul writes, we proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. I want you to know how much I am struggling for you and for those at Laodicea, and for all who have not met me personally. My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments, for though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit, and delight to see how orderly you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world, rather than on Christ. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. Here ends the reading of God's word. Now a friend of mine who used to be a pastor at Christchurch Stellenbosch, Doug Wannenberg, you might know him, he used to organize an annual golf day uh, to raise support for the student ministry in his local church. And Doug really had a way of kind of uh, exciting people to donate all of these very expensive items which were then auctioned off at an auction after the golf day. And I don't know how he did it, but one day he managed to get someone to donate a red Ferrari cap that had been signed by Michael Schumacher. And this cap was very popular at the bidding. It went back and forth. And eventually it was sold to a man for 11,000 rand. 
But when that man came forward to collect the cap, he said that he wouldn't make any payment until a certificate of genuineness could be presented to him showing that it was in fact the real signature of Michael Schumacher. And this friend Doug of mine, he didn't have the certificate and he had to go and find someone who knew the character traits and the content of a genuine Michael Schumacher signature. Now, there's something similar happening in this letter of Colossians in chapter 2, where Paul is writing from prison to this group of very new young converts, and he's equipping them to be able to discern the difference between genuine Bible teaching and deceptive Bible teaching. So these believers in Colossae are very new to the faith. Paul hasn't met them personally, but he's heard about them from his colleague Epaphras and he begins the letter with great encouragement having heard of their faith in Christ and their love for other Christians their hope ultimately for heaven he's heard of how they're growing in the gospel and their knowledge of God and it's really beginning to change their lives and then at the end of chapter 1 Paul expounds the person of Christ and all his supremacy over all creation and all salvation and he touches on the doctrines of justification and reconciliation of how we made right before God through the cross and how through the cross we brought into right relationship with God but in chapter 2 Paul begins to raise concern about these young believers he knows that they're living in a port city where there's a harbor where on a daily basis professional paid public speakers are passing through looking for others to share their ideas with, including these young Colossian Christians. And at the time in the Roman Empire, Christianity was actually beginning to become very popular. Uh, more and more people were hearing this news of a real Jewish man in Jerusalem who claimed to be God and had risen from the dead. And many people were beginning to gather in large crowds to hear teaching from the scriptures of the spiritual implications of these events and so it presents a huge opportunity to the eyewitness apostles and Paul and his colleagues Epaphras and Timothy to go into these cities and to proclaim the saving message of the gospel but at the same time others began to see it as their opportunity claiming to be Bible teachers Yet doing it deceptively, we realize this in chapter 2 verse 19, these people didn't have a real relationship with Christ. And yet they were teaching the Bible to gain a following for themselves and for their own interests, particularly their own financial gain. And so this is one of the reasons I think a letter like this, and especially chapter 2, is so hugely relevant to our world right now, to the moment in history where we find ourselves, where if we just think of the last 16 months with COVID-19, uh, there's been an explosion of Christian Bible teaching online on platforms like this, YouTube or on Facebook or TikTok. Uh, it's incredible that, you know, a couple of years ago, it was very unusual for a pastor to present a message uh, using a video like this one. And yet there is an endless supply now of Christian Bible teaching online. And very often what we're seeing is that people come along with this claiming to be Bible teachers, sometimes claiming all kinds of titles like apostle or man of God or prophet. And they're using this platform deceptively to lure people in for their own gain. And very often you'll see that people ask for a kind of financial contribution to their ministry. And so it's a huge opportunity for genuine Bible teachers to get the message of Christ out there but it's also a threat to many young believers who often find it difficult to discern between what is genuine and what is deceptive Bible teaching so the Apostle Paul here he's equipping us with the ability to identify genuine and deceptive Bible teaching and he gives us the character traits and the teaching content to look out for so we'll start with the character traits to look out for in deceptive Bible teaching 
Now you might be saying, you know, Chris, I'm not so sure people are really wanting to deceive me through Bible teaching. But just look with me at chapter 2, verse 4. Paul says, I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. So Paul says there actually are people who want to deceive. The word there is to trick us uh, through fine-sounding arguments using the scriptures. So the first character trait that we do have to look out for, number one, is an ability to persuade. Paul speaks there about fine-sounding arguments. So very often deceptive Bible teaching is clothed in this ability to persuade. A great intelligence often, good relational abilities or communication skills, which makes the person very difficult to disagree with. Now, an ability to persuade is not wrong in and of itself, but when it's used to deceive... It can do great damage. And so whenever we see someone growing in popularity with a great persuasive ability, we should always be cautious um, as to what it is that they're teaching. So the first thing to look out for is an ability to persuade. The second thing is a humility that's false. Just look over with me at chapter 2 verse 18. Paul says, do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you for the prize. Such a person goes into great detail about what he has seen and his unspiritual mind puffs him up with idle notions. And then down in verse 23, again, Paul mentions these people have the appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship. Again, he says their false humility. So, on stage or behind a camera, deceptive Bible teaching can appear incredibly humble. People can present themselves as humble servants of God. They can go into detail of all of their spiritual disciplines and practices to present themselves as very kind of holy, more spiritual than most people. But Paul says the problem with this, although people may get an Oscar for their performance of humility, the problem is that it's false it's dishonest paul says that it comes from an unspiritual mind uh, being able to spin all kinds of lies about things that they have seen or maybe heard from god or experiences that they've had paul says in verse 19 this is done with someone who doesn't have a real relationship with christ so we need to look out for an ability to persuade a humility that's false. And the last kind of character trait to look out for is an attitude of judgment over things that Christ doesn't judge over. Now in one of Paul's other letters, 1 Corinthians, in chapter 11 verse 31, Paul says that there is a place to judge ourselves as Christians. To, As we come to communion and we realize what Christ did at the cross and we, what he's calling us to in his commands, there's a place for us to judge ourselves, to repent of sin, so that we don't come into final judgment. In the letter in chapter 5, verse 12, Paul even says there's a place to judge other believers within the church. Not in a sense of wanting to condemn people, but out of concern and love for people to see where people are not living in line with Christ's commands and to call one another to repentance and faith. But this kind of judgment that Paul's talking about here is the word he uses is of someone taking the posture of a tennis umpire, sitting on their high chair with their own rule book, which Christ hasn't written, and they're calling out, they're calling fault in the church over all kinds of things that Christ isn't concerned about. Paul tells us what some of these things are in chapter 2, verse 16. Judging people over what you eat or you drink. Maybe whether you had a salad or a bacon sandwich for lunch. Or a glass of water or a glass of wine. Or which day of the week you take as a day of rest. Whether it's Saturday or Sunday or Monday. Or how you celebrate certain religious occasions. In our case, Christmas or Easter. In the Old Testament sense, a festival like Passover. And Paul says that these things, in verse 17 of chapter 2, were shadows of Christ who was coming around the corner in the New Testament. 
And now that Christ is here, he doesn't judge people over those Old Testament shadows. But Paul says, deceptive Bible teachers get all hung up about these things which Christ isn't concerned about. So we need to be attentive in listening to Bible teaching, asking, does this person have an ability to persuade a humility that's false or an attitude of judgment over things that Christ doesn't judge over? Now, while the character traits are what lure people in to becoming deceptive Bible teachers, regular listeners and subscribers, it's not the character traits themselves that disqualify people for heaven and take people captive to hell, but it's the content of their teaching that does this. Just look with me at chapter 2, verse 18. Sorry, chapter 2, verse 8. Paul says there, See to it that no one takes you captive. That word means literally kidnaps you spiritually and carries you off away from Christ through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. So recently I was on Facebook and I was looking at a, a post of someone who used to be in our local church and hasn't been there for some time. And they were posting about a spiritual healer that they were interested in. And this spiritual healer was offering people um, spiritual counsel for 300 rand an hour. And so I went into their post and I looked at some of the things on their profile. And all of the things that they were sharing, the advice they were sharing, were things like letting go of past hurt or learning to be vulnerable about our brokenness or taking control of your relationships, all sort of things that in our world people already accept and affirm as being true. People like those kind of philosophies and ideologies. And Paul says this is the signal in terms of content of false deceptive Bible teaching because in every passage of Scripture, what deceptive Bible teaching does is it hollows Christ out. Maybe not in name, but in person and in his work, they hollow Christ out and they fill their teaching with all kinds of worldly philosophies and ideologies and principles that the world already affirms and believes so that people feel good hearing this teaching and then they come back and they listen to more and they share it with others. And so in essence, Deceptive Bible teaching, Paul says, is man-centered, not Christ-centered. It's not centered on the beauty of Christ and His work for us. It's centered on you. It's centered on equipping you with worldly tools and principles to be able to better your situation in this world, in this life, whether it be success in your career or skills and leadership or learning to be vulnerable about our brokenness or gaining financial freedom. But it's devoid of Christ. And so we need to, in all of our Bible uh, teaching that we're listening to, ask ourselves, even if it makes me feel good, is this centered on the person of Christ? You see, if before becoming a Christian, Satan pursues us as a lion, wanting to devour and destroy us. Very often in the West, Satan ha controls us in fear through maybe horror movies we've watched of exorcisms or Satanism or the occult. Or if you're from more traditional culture or religion, a very real fear that you might have of a demonic possession you've seen or uh, witchcraft or sorcery. But you know that when you're in Christ, Satan cannot devour you as the lion. So he retreats as the lion. But Paul is warning us here that he reappears as a serpent wanting to deceive. I was reading about the green mamba snake that really has to pursue its prey. But all it does is it camouflages itself on a green fruit tree the same color as its skin and it patiently waits for a person or an animal to come close and to reach out for a piece of fruit 
and then it repeatedly strikes its victim with its deadly venom see paul is saying that is how satan wants to capture us he wants to deceive us through camouflaging himself against deceptive bible teaching so we must watch out for not just the character traits but also the content of the teaching that we're listening to now obviously we don't just want to be saying okay don't listen to this or don't listen to that but we want to say what is genuine bible teaching so that we can look for and we can listen to as much bible teaching as we need so we can grow in our faith in christ and what's great about this passage is there's really only one thing that paul says we need to know to to look out for genuine bible teaching and paul says this this is the point that genuine bible teaching struggles energetically to present the word of god in all of its fullness to show christ to everyone so in chapter 1 verse 24 paul's already spoken about how he rejoiced that he suffered physically in his body so that he could get to other believers and share the word of god in all of its fullness and so the question becomes how do you teach the bible in all of its fullness and paul actually tells us in verse 27 that the way you do that is by uncovering the mystery of scripture of the bible which he says is christ in you the hope of glory and then in verse 28 paul actually says this is exactly what he and his colleagues did he says we proclaim him that's christ admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in christ he says to this end i labor struggling with all his energy which so powerfully works in me so the way that you identify genuine bible teaching is that you need to get up close to the teacher you need to be able to see in their day-to-day -day life in their week-to-week -week ministry that in whatever they're doing they are laboring they are struggling in the scriptures they are working hard that in whatever ministry they're doing whether they're speaking behind a camera or they're speaking to someone personally one-on-one -on -one, or they're speaking to a married couple having problems in their marriage or they're preaching at a wedding or a funeral or they're doing evangelism in someone's home that in all that ministry they are seeking to find and uncover and to lift up the person of Jesus Christ as the only diamond to be found in Scripture turning him to show all of his splendid sides that Scripture presents him with holding him up as the only Lord and Savior to be loved and listened to and to let lead you as Paul says in chapter 2 verse 2 the one in whom are found all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge so avoid being under the influence of teaching that is devoid of Christ and bring yourself under the influence and the subscription of Bible teaching that proclaims and presents Christ from the Word of God in the Bible see sometimes when you're a new believer we can think that Christ is the beginning of the Christian journey we can think Christ is the, the gate onto the spiritual pathway of progress and growth and sometimes we think okay I've received Christ as Lord and uh, I believe that he died and rose from the dead what is the next spiritual signpost that I need to look out for maybe I need to understand the Old Testament laws and rules and how to keep them maybe I need some spiritual experience to kind of take me to a higher height spiritually but Paul says no the next spiritual signpost to look out for is Christ and the one after that is Christ and the one after that again and again and again is Christ until you get to the end when you stand before God and you are presented perfect in Christ 
clothed with the gift of his righteousness, making you holy and blameless, having seen the mouth of Satan and his spiritual forces silenced in their charges against you because your faith was in Christ and his death on the cross for you alone. So Paul says genuine Bible teaching teaches you from Scripture that Christ is all you need. So find Bible teaching that reveals Christ to you in the New Testament and that shows Christ concealed in all the stories of the Old Testament. See, this is Paul's argument in this section of the letter. In verse 6, he says there to these young believers, he says, So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, when you became a Christian, you received him as Lord. He says, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught. So Paul's saying, look, to grow as a Christian, you don't have to go and look for other teaching out there over and above Christ. He says, continue to grow in the teaching that brought you into a relationship with Christ. See, Paul is saying the only safe ground to grow in is Christ. He's saying that spirituality without Jesus is like a dry yellow desert without water. Christ is the rock from whom all spiritual water flows. There are no spiritual treasures for you and I to find outside of a relationship with Jesus. And the reason for this, Paul tells us in verse 9, is he says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. So Paul is saying, look, when Jesus was in his body on earth, he wasn't just half God, half man. He was fully God, fully man. And now that Christ has risen from the dead in his glorified resurrection body, he remains fully God. And so if your faith is in Jesus, you have God. You have a relationship with God. And through God's Spirit, you have fullness spiritually in everything that you could enjoy in terms of your spiritual growth. So Paul is saying to us, it's only Christ who has the keys to eternal death and eternal life. It's only Christ who hung on the cross to pay for our sins and cancel the charge that stood against us. It's only Christ who came back from the dead alive. And it's only Christ who will give you the wisdom to live your Christian life for him. So in all the Bible teaching that we look for, or we listen to, before we push play or before we push subscribe or before we push share or before we push forward, Paul would challenge us to ask ourselves, is this presenting and proclaiming the fullness of Christ and his work? And I just want to encourage you as a church here at Christchurch Tigerberg, knowing the leaders of this church and those that teach the scriptures here, that I can say to you that this is a church that wants to lift up Christ in all of his fullness. Whether it's in small group Bible studies or Sunday sermons, or whether it's in other ministries, you will find Christ in this church. And so I encourage you to continue to grow in him as you listen to and you continue to benefit from the teaching here at Christ Church Tigerberg. So, would you join me as I pray for all of us together? Let's pray. Father, we do come before you today and we thank you that you brought genuine Bible teachers into our life. You brought men and women who loved us and who not only loved us, but also taught the word of God to us. We thank you for our salvation in Christ, that we can know you as the treasure of scripture the one in whom all wisdom and knowledge is to be found and we pray that as we continue to grow in our faith not only listening to your word but also putting it into practice that we would continue to be rooted
and built up as individual believers and also as churches in this community in this country and we just pray for all pastors today who will be preaching and sharing your word uh, in different platforms or mediums that father that those that have struggled energetically to present christ that um, they would have an influence and that lord you would advance that message and you would diminish the deceptive uh, bible teaching that satan wants to take people captive through and we just pray this all for your sake and glory Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Right, well, it was a great pleasure to be with you this morning, and we hope you have a wonderful Sunday ahead. Goodbye.